Chapter 12 of The Adventures of Ferdinand Count Fathom by Tobias Smollett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In consequence of this determination, he to the uttermost exerted his good humour among the few friends of consequence his fortune had left, and even carried his complaisance so far as to become the humble servant of their pleasures, while he attempted to extend his acquaintance in an inferior path of life, where he thought his talents would shine more conspicuous than at the assemblies of the great, and conduce more effectually to the interest of all his designs. Nor did he find himself disappointed in that expectation, sanguine as it was. He soon found means to be introduced to the house of a wealthy bourgeois, where every individual was charmed with his easy air and extraordinary qualifications. He accommodated himself surprisingly to the humours of the whole family, smoked tobacco, swallowed wine, and discoursed of stones with the husband, who was a rich jeweller, sacrificed himself to the pride and loquacity of the wife, and played upon the violin, and sung alternately, for the amusement of his only daughter, a buxom lass, nearly of his own age, the fruit of a former marriage. It was not long before Ferdinand had reason to congratulate himself on the footing he had gained in this society. He had expected to find, and in a little time actually discovered, that mutual jealousy and rancour which almost always subsist between a daughter and her step-dame, inflamed with all the virulence of female emulation. For the disparity in their ages served only to render them the more inveterate rivals in the desire of captivating the other sex. Our adventurer, having deliberated upon the means of converting this animosity to his own advantage, saw no method for this purpose so feasible as that of making his approaches to the hearts of both, by ministering to each in private, food for their reciprocal envy and malevolence. Because he well knew that no road lies so direct and open to a woman's heart as that of gratifying her passions of vanity and resentment. When he had an opportunity of being particular with the mother, he expressed his concern for having unwittingly incurred the displeasure of Mademoiselle, which, he observed, was obvious in every circumstance of her behaviour towards him, protesting he was utterly innocent of all intention of offending her, and that he could not account for his disgrace any other way than by supposing she took umbrage at the direction of his chief regards towards her mother-in-law, which, he owned, was altogether involuntary being wholly influenced by that lady's superior charms and politeness. Such a declaration was perfectly well calculated for the meridian of a dame like her, who with all the intoxications of unenlightened pride, and an increased appetite for pleasure, had begun to find herself neglected, and even to believe that her attractions were actually on the wane. She very graciously consoled our gallant for the mishap of which he complained, representing Wilhelmina, that was the daughter's name, as a pert, illiterate, envious baggage, of whose disgust he ought to make no consideration. Then she recounted many instances of her own generosity to that young lady, with the returns of malice and ingratitude she had made. And lastly enumerated all the imperfections of her person, education, and behaviour, that he might see with what justice the gipsy pretended to vie with those who had been distinguished by the approbation and even gallantry of the best people in Vienna. Having thus established himself her confidant and gossip, he knew his next step of promotion would necessarily be to the degree of her lover, and in that belief resolved to play the same game with Mademoiselle Wilhelmina, whose complexion was very much akin to that of her stepmother. Indeed, they resembled each other too much to live upon any terms of friendship or even decorum. Fathom, in order to enjoy a private conversation with the young lady, never failed to repeat his visit every afternoon, till at length he had the pleasure of finding her disengaged, the jeweller being occupied among his workmen, and his wife gone to assist at a lying in. Our adventurer and the daughter had already exchanged their vows, by the expressive language of the eyes. He had even declared himself in some tender ejaculations which had been softly whispered in her ear, when he could snatch an opportunity of venting them unperceived. Nay, he had upon diverse occasions gently squeezed her fair hand, on pretense of tuning her harpsichord, and been favoured with returns of the same cordial pressure, so that, instead of accosting her with the fearful hesitation and reserve of a timid swain, he told her, after the exercise of the dosieux, 
that he was come to confer with her upon a subject that nearly concerned her peace, and asked if she had not observed of late an evident abatement of friendship in her mother's behaviour to him, whom she had formerly treated with such marks of favour and respect. Mademoiselle would not pay so ill a compliment to her own discernment as to say she had not perceived the alteration, which, on the contrary, she owned was extremely palpable, nor was it difficult to divine the cause of such estranged looks. This remark was accompanied with an irresistible glance. She smiled enchanting, the colour deepened on her cheeks, her breast began to heave, and her whole frame underwent a most agreeable confusion. Ferdinand, who was not a man to let such a favourable conjecture pass unregarded, "'Yes, charming Wilhelmina,' exclaimed the politician in an affected rapture, "'the cause is as conspicuous as your attractions. She hath, in spite of all my circumspection, perceived that passion which it is not in my power to conceal, and in consequence of which I now declare myself your devoted adorer, or, conscious of your superior excellence, her jealousy hath taken the alarm, and though stung with conjecture only, repines at the triumph of your perfections. How far this spirit of malignity may be inflamed to my prejudice I know not. Perhaps, as this is the first, it may also be the last opportunity I shall have of avowing the dearest sentiments of my heart to the fair object that inspired them. In a word, I may be for ever excluded from your presence. Excuse me, then, divine creature, from the practice of those unnecessary forms which I should take pride in observing, were I indulged with the ordinary privileges of an honourable lover. And, once for all, accept the homage of a heart overflowing with love and admiration. Yes, adorable Wilhelmina, I am dazzled with your supernatural beauty. Your other accomplishments strike me with wonder and awe. I am enchanted by the graces of your deportment ravished with the charms of your conversation, and there is a certain tenderness of benevolence in that endearing aspect, which, I trust, will not fail to melt with sympathy at the emotions of a faithful slave like me. So saying, he threw himself upon his knees, and seizing her plump hand, pressed it to his lips with all the violence of real transport. The nymph, whose passions nature had filled to the brim, could not hear such a rhapsody unmoved. Being an utter stranger to addresses of this kind, she understood every word of it in the literal acceptation. She believed implicitly in the truth of the encomiums he had bestowed, and thought it reasonable he should be rewarded for the justice he had done to her qualifications, which had hitherto been almost altogether overlooked. In short, her heart began to thaw, and her face to hang out the flag of capitulation, which was no sooner perceived by our hero then he renewed his attack with redoubled fervour, pronouncing in a most vehement tone, Light of my eyes, and empress of my soul, behold me prostrate at your feet, waiting with the most pious resignation, for that sentence from your lips, on which my future happiness or misery must altogether depend. Not with more reverence does the unhappy Bashaw kiss the sultan's letter that contains his doom, than I will submit to your fatal determination. Speak then, angelic sweetness, for never, ah, never will I rise from this suppliant posture until I am encouraged to live and hope. No, if you refuse to smile upon my passion, here shall I breathe the last sighs of a despairing lover. Here shall this faithful sword do the last office to its unfortunate master, and shed the blood of the truest heart that ever felt the cruel pangs of disappointed love. The young lady, well nigh overcome by this effusion, which brought the tears into her eyes, Enough, enough, cried she, interrupting him. Sure you men were created for the ruin of our sex. Ruin, re-echoed Fathom, talk not of ruin and Wilhelmina. Let these terms be for ever parted, for as the east and west asunder. Let ever smiling peace attend her steps, and love and joy still wanton in her train. Ruin, indeed, shall wait upon her enemies, if such there be, and those love-lorn wretches who pine with anguish under her disdain. Grant me, kind heaven, a more propitious boon. Direct her genial regards to one whose love is without example, 
and whose constancy is unparalleled. Bear witness to my constancy and faith, ye verdant hills, ye fertile plains, ye shady groves, ye purling streams, and if I prove untrue, ah! Let me never find a solitary willow or a bubbling brook, by help of which I may be enabled to put a period to my wretched life. Here this excellent actor began to sob most piteously, and the tender-hearted Wilhelmina, unable longer to withstand his moving tale, with a repetition of the interjection, ah, gently dropped into his arms. This was the beginning of a correspondence that soon rose to a very interesting pitch and they forthwith concerted measures for carrying it on without the knowledge or suspicion of her mother-in-law. Nevertheless, the young lady vanquished as she was, and unskilled in the ways of men, would not all at once yield at discretion, but insisted upon those terms without which no woman's reputation can be secured. Our lover, far from seeking to evade the proposal, assented to it in terms of uncommon satisfaction, and promised to use his whole industry in finding a priest upon whose discretion they could rely. Nay, he certainly resolved to comply with her request in good earnest, rather than forfeit the advantages which he foresaw in their union. His good fortune, however, exempted him from the necessity of taking such a step, which at best must have been disagreeable. For so many difficulties occurred in the inquiry which was set on foot, and so artfully did Fathom in the meantime manage the influence he had already gained over her heart, that, before her passion could obtain a legal gratification, she surrendered to his wish, without any other assurance than his solemn profession of sincerity and truth, on which she reposed herself with the most implicit confidence and faith. End of chapter 12